Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Again, welcome to the Dynamic Languages for Scientific Computing uh, session. I'm very happy to have Jan Vitek here. I actually met him at uh, something called VSC, which is Virtual Environments, Virtual Execution Environments for Scientific Computing, which uh, Jan was organizing and fascinating discussion with researchers from industry and academia about how dynamic languages work. Jan himself has been working on programming languages, implementation and design for over 20 years. He's done all kinds of things that he's quite famous for, including making the first real-time JVM for Java. Uh, and a variety of other things. Um, uh, I love the fact that, you know, right in his bio, he says that you know, his, one of his most important goals is increasing the productivity of programmers, something that is very near and dear to my heart as well. And, um, and one of the ways that he's excited about doing that is through dynamic languages, because especially early in the software uh, development cycle, dynamic languages can be an extremely powerful way to get things done. Um, and to that end, actually, some of his most recent work um, has been on something that he calls shard, or software hardening, where he goes from dynamic languages to harden that into solid code to increase the overall engineering process to get from fast prototypes into like working code that can, that can last in the enterprise. And actually, that work, turns out, uh, has won him the 2011 CIF Award, which is a Software Engineering Innovation Foundation Award from Microsoft Research. So congratulations, Jan. And uh, I think Judith wants to say a couple words about that. Yeah, great. So uh, we're delighted to actually today to be able to present Young with this award. He wasn't at the big award ceremony in Hawaii, but uh, we think Redmond is a suitable place to present it. So Ashwin Samuel, who was uh, running the CIF Awards for 2011, and myself are, are here. And Young, if you'd like to step over. Sure. <laughs> and this is the... Microsoft Research Award that he gets, and Thank you. now we have to shake hands and smile. <laughs> That's right. Oh. Tony Hay taught me how to do this, you see. Okay. And um, this is also for you. It's oh. a, a token of our appreciation very nice. from the Pacific Northwest. Great. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. All right. Okay, well, um, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, to have this opportunity. Let me just adjust this a little bit. To have this opportunity to speak at the uh, Microsoft Summit, and what we'll be talking about both in this session and in this afternoon session uh, are uses of dynamic languages, and in particular for scientific computing. So, dynamic languages are a class of programming languages that have very specific features that are widely used in practice and are mostly ignored by the research and academic community. Okay? And so what I want to do is try to sort of convince you uh, that they're an interesting topic of study, that they're, uh, they're very useful, and that there's good research work to be done in this field. So, Stepping back a little bit, what is a programming language? A programming language is just a tool that gives us a vocabulary of abstractions to, to solve computational problems, right? And if a scientist comes to you, a biologist, a physicist, and says, which programming language should I pick for my next project? So what should be the answer, right? You're a computer specialist. You know how to reboot uh, uh, an Apple laptop. So you're, you know, you're, you're equipped for, uh, to answer this. And uh, you know, there are hundreds, thousands of programming languages out there. What is a criterion for goodness? How do I measure the quality of a programming language? Well, a simple way is to take a particular task and look uh, at the code generated by that language and say, how fast does it run on my architecture of choice? And that's a perfectly fine metric because it's a metric. We can easily measure it, but it's completely irrelevant for most scientists. 
Because what they're interested in is measuring the time to solution from the point they start working on a problem till the point they get the first answer to their initial question. And then, you know, when they realize that that answer was not what they were looking for, the time it takes them to change their code, change their algorithms, and gets the next round of iteration, and so on. So, yes, compute time is important, but it's only a small part often in the scientific process. Most, mostly people are worried about, you know, how long will it take me to develop the code, how long will it me, uh, take me to craft the software? So um, this, this sort of opposition manifests itself, this tension manifests itself in programming language designs. So you have some languages that are more end user centric, and there are other programming languages that have been designed by and for computer scientists. Okay? There are languages that encourage an exploratory programming uh, model and others that are more geared towards efficient batch processing. There are languages that, um, that are thought of as being naturally interpreted and others are thought of as not being naturally compiled. Now, of course, nowadays that, that, that distinction is, is, really, is, is really not there anymore. We can compile any language or interpret any language, but dynamic languages tend to be harder to generate efficient code for. Okay? And this is all old. You know, this is old. It comes back from, you know, it goes all the way back to Lisp and Fortran. So, in 1958, when John McCarthy was working on adding lists to Fortran, that was his task, he picked uh, algebraic differentiation as his problem of choice, and he very, very quickly came to the realization that Fortran wouldn't do it. It was not just the addition of lists that was needed, it was a whole new language, and that's how Lisp came about. And the goal of Lisp was really to make it clearer, easier to express scientific uh, solution to scientific problems. So all the way from, from that time, people have been looking at more, more languages that make it easier to solve you know, problem, to express the solutions more clearly and more succinctly and more naturally. And over the year, a large number of languages have been designed that fall in this dynamic language category. So here's you know, a random bag of those with uh, uh, the choice of font is, is somewhat meaningful for me, but yeah, it doesn't matter, really. So, so I say there are lots of languages. Let's think a little bit at what are the languages people design, you know, the language designer's view of language. So to take, if, you, if you want, you can take the last 20 years two decades, and look at what are some of the you know, main languages that were designed of, over those 20 years. So if we start from 91 with Visual Basic and Python, and we'll go all the way to, to show that we'll hear more about this afternoon, and you look at all of these languages, and you know, they're all dynamic. Well, not quite. Uh, there are a couple of functional languages thrown in here for, for fun, Scala and F Sharp. And uh, Java and C Sharp, well, you know, they have sort of a static type system, but really behind the cover, they're all dynamic too. So what have we been designing for the last 20 years? We've been designing dynamic languages. And, you know, as part of the programming language community, what have we been thinking about? We've been thinking about analyzing, proving, compiling static languages. So there's a very fundamental sort of problem here. You know, the programming language experts are not solving the problems people are, are actually having. So that's, you know, that's, that's, that's an issue. But maybe this is just the, the language designer's problems, right? Maybe the users are, are, are better people. So how can we uh, measure popularity of programming language? Well, I have no clue, but I'll give you two metrics that are as good and as bad as any other. So the first one is uh, an analysis that was done by Drew Conway using the statistic language R of Twitter tra traffic. So he was looking at keywords, language names appearing in Twitter messages with this sort of idea that if you see one language being more frequently talked about, that means it's more popular. Okay? Um, and if I highlight the dynamic languages, all right, 
So that gives us a, 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 a picture of how enlightened Twitter, Twitter users are. They love dynamic languages, and they particularly love PHP, which is kind of depressing. Uh, <laughs> but moving on. So the other metric I can give you is books, right? If a language deserves a book, that's already something. And if people are willing to buy that book, that's even better, right? So here are book sales out of Powell Bookstore. And the first two, two language up to, uh, languages up there are Java and C++, which obviously are going to show up because we're twisting the arms of our student to learn these two languages in our intro classes. But if I play the same game and overlay this, with, uh, sort of highlight the dynamic languages, more than half of the languages that are on the list are dynamic languages. All right. So, so dynamic, dynamic languages are somewhat popular. And I haven't said yet what they are. And I won't. I will not give you a clean description or a clear, clean definition of what a, li a dynamic language is. But what I can tell you is a profile, a set of features that occur together in all those dynamic languages that you know, people uh, you know, like to point to and say, oh, this is a dynamic language. So what are the features that these languages have? The first and foremost is dynamic typing. So all of these languages that we're going to be talking about today have no type annotation. So you never write the type of this variable is int. Never, you never do that, right? There's no type. That means you have no type checking. You have no compile, uh, compiler to help you. On the, on, on, on the other hand, there are types in the system, but they're hidden and they, they, they come up at runtime, OK? Um, all of these languages support late binding, the ability to rebind function names dynamically. So, so you, you don't have to decide what function you, you're, you're calling until runtime. All of these languages have support for reflection. So the ability to computationally look at the program structure and modify the behavior of the program uh, in interesting ways. All of these languages are interactive. They give you a shell, an ability for users to type commands that become part of the program at runtime. These languages are almost always permissive. And by that, I mean they go against the grain of you know, the accepted software engineering uh, you know, precepts, which are you know, uh, information hiding, you know, show as little as you can. No, no, no. In dynamic languages, people should do everything they want to do. You know, as long as the computer can do it, you know, why, why prevent them from doing it? So that's the, that's the motto. They have often a lightweight and domain-specific syntax, which makes it easier to express the problems at hand. Strangely enough, they are pretty much all single-threaded. Yeah? So why is that? Maybe just an accident. Maybe, um, maybe it's because if you're dealing with a language that's so dynamic, adding uh, data races is a headache that you don't need. Maybe speed is never an issue in those languages. Hard to tell, but they are typically like that. Failure oblivious. Well, that's an interesting property. So uh, dynamic languages try to hide failures from the users, from the user. They try to keep the program running as long as possible. I'll give examples of these things later on. But you know, just uh, this is an interesting property because often what we tend to think is, well, if there's a mistake, we should throw an exception and stop execution right here and there. Uh, they're all garbage collected. They mostly have support for either language embedding or extension. So embedding is when you take your dynamic language and you put it within a, another host language. An extension is when you have the ability to add lower level uh, com uh, components uh, that can be called from your dynamic language. They all have built in high level data structures. And lastly, they're all running very slowly, OK? So it's a, it's a mix of features. Some of them are by design. Some of them you know, come from the rest, right? So it turns out that performance challenged is uh, probably a result of all the other features I've listed. Yeah? OK. 
So, so what I've been arguing so far is that dynamic languages are everywhere. They are very uh, widely used both by you know, end users and they're by developers. That they are popular to some extent. So what I want to argue in the rest of the talk are, is that they are indeed successful. That it's not just bad tastes that make people use those languages. Though you know, often bad taste has some, uh, some part in it. And um, that in the second part of the talk, when we talk about the research, I want to, to, to sort of convince you that there is a lot of research to turn these languages to, and transform them into languages that have both the benefits of the dynamism and of some of the static features uh, that we, we kind of love uh, in normal, traditional programming languages. Okay, so the way I want to proceed is by uh, giving you an, a number of example case studies, example of dynamic languages, and then focus on some of these properties I've mentioned earlier. So it, I will alternate between actual languages to show you how these are used, what the, they are in practice, and you know, a little bit of a discussion on you know, their, uh, their intrinsic nature. So the, I wanted to start with a uh, you know, widely used language for scientific computing, which probably, yeah, I don't know. I would say m most of you probably haven't used, but then again, uh, you, you sometimes, uh, sometimes you're wrong. So the language I want to start with is R. R is a language that is used by pretty much all statisticians and many biologists and you know, many people out there. It's just not one that uh, we typically hear about in, uh, in computer science uh, circles. It's a language for data analysis, for graphics, which comes from an earlier language named S that was designed at Bell Labs and now is an open source effort. Yeah? So um, what is the, the, how do people use a dynamic language and this one in particular? So R has a very nice and rich uh, interactive development environment and the workflow, um, the way people approach working with a dynamic language is slightly different than what we do normally in normal programming. What people will do is they'll start by reading some data in into a bunch of variables and then the uh, IDE lets you very quickly plot that data. So you see some, some nice graphs. Then, you know, typically they will proceed by making a summary or two. Then they will start doing more intricate statistical analysis of their, of their data. And then they will realize, well, they're repeating the same steps uh, over, over and over. So they will write a few simple R functions that automate the analysis. And before you know it, they're programming, okay? So the success of R comes uh, in large part because it has this very wide uh, set of libraries. So I'm plotting here the growth of R packages between 2000 and 2011. Nowadays, there are over 4,000 statistical libraries, you know, big wads of uh, statistic code that are available in a well-documented and self-testing format. You know, that's, that's something we should you know, learn from. So any R package comes with a vignette that you can grab, paste in the ID, and it self-tests the package, and it does something visible. And it comes also with a nice LaTeX documentation that displays in the ID. So you know, they're not doing all wrong. As a programming language, how does it look? Well, uh, as a programming language, it's a functional language. It emphasizes the use of functions and it restricts side effects. And it's a very concise language. So here's a bit of R code. So I'm going to define a function here, function that takes an argument, and I'm going to even define a default value for that argument and say, you know, and then bind that function to the identifier cube. So now I can call cube without argument, in which case we take the default. I can call cube with a single argument, in which case we'll pass that in. Or I can call cube with a named argument by saying, well, you know, make sure to bind for to uh, parameter x. And this is very useful because a lot of the 
plotting functions have all the way to till 35 arguments. And remembering the order of 35 arguments is sometimes taxing. So it's quite convenient. Uh, R has powerful array and matrix operations. So for instance, this creates an array. And note that there is a value NA here. And that's really important for statistics, the ability to model missing values. So that's a value like any other. And I can create a subset of this array. This is an array, a subarray. The next expression creates a subarray from column one to three. I can create a, an array where I exclude all but column one. Or more excitingly, I can take my array, find all the missing values, and replace them with zero in a single expression. And now this is really powerful, right? Now, you could do this in, 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 in Java, but it would take many more lines. All right. R has powerful graphics. So these two lines of R code take a table and plot it. And you get sort of this result. And you can see there are you know, axes. The axes have labels. The labels are pulled from the data automatically. So it's really, really easy to generate graphical output. Right? Um, R has more interesting features. One of them is that it's a lazy, lazy programming language. So in programming language terminology, a lazy language is a, la a language for, uh, which only evaluates expressions when it has to. So what does that mean? Well, here this, there is a line, there is a function call to the function with, with two arguments, formaldehyde and this other expression, carbs time opt then. And what R does is it's going to package both arguments, the, the first one and then the second expression, into something called promises, which will be evaluated if and when they're actually required. So to some extent, we could say that R is the most widely used lazy functional language out there. You know, so, so if there are any Haskell fans, you know, see me after, we can duke it out. Um, what, that, what that function does actually is even more interesting because what it does is formaldehyde is an object that binds some fields to values, and carb times opten will be evaluated in the context of that object. So carb and opten are fields of formaldehyde, but you know, we'll see that more uh, in a little bit. Another thing that R has and emphasizes is uh, support and tools for reproducible uh, science, reproducible experiments. So R has packaged with it uh, with a version of the literate programming, uh, you know, sort of Knuth literate, literate programming idea, where you know, which uh, a tool called Sweave that lets people write an, a paper in LaTeX with R code embedded. And once they submit it, they can submit the paper with the data. And generating the PDF causes the data to be recomputed and ensures that whenever you generate the data, you know exactly where that data came from and how you know, the statistics were done. And another feature of R that helps reproducibility is every element of the language, even a, a simple integer, can be tagged. And these tags, for instance, can, uh, can uh, can uh, tell you the provenance of the data. So there is deep support for reproducible science in a very dynamic language. Okay? And this picture here is, uh, is from uh, the New York Times website a couple of days ago, where two scientists, two statisticians, found a fault in a major cancer study. And the code behind them is R code. They were using their you know, methodology and tools to do this. And the interesting thing about the fault, so they published a scientific paper about all the flaws of the cancer study, which uh, was a, a massive embarrassment for the, uh, the authors of that study. And you know, out of all the flaws, you look at them and you think, so how many would have been helped by a static programming language? The answer is none. So what were the flaws? Things like mislabeled data. So nothing we can do about that. So the one I prefer was there was an off by one error in an Excel spreadsheet. You know, Excel is all floating points, so types would, the type system would have been perfectly happy with this. But you know, the computational results were wrong, 
and the whole startup that was that was created to 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 you know to cash in on this this uh, on this study well, uh, essentially is going to shut down. Okay, so. So to summarize my quick tour of R, R is everything. It's a dynamic language, a vector language, an object-oriented language, I didn't mention, but it is, a functional language and a lazy language. Uh, you know, it has all the features that I mentioned that a dynamic language should have. This is a very interesting case study. Now, there, there are many disadvantages to R, and um, if you ask me later, I can tell you what these are, but it is also a very powerful tool, and it's really widely used. So we should pay attention to this. That's the, you know, the part of the message I'm going to harp on. OK, so now I'll switch to the features of these languages. And I'll, I'm going to, um, to, to mention you know, the, the key feature right, that I said uh, at, at the outset for, of, of all dynamic languages is the fact that, that they have dynamic typing. And dynamic typing is also sometimes referred to in the press as duck typing. You know, something to do with the fact that it, if it uh, walks, swims, and quacks, then maybe, you know, it's, yeah. Um, so what does that mean in, in sort of more technical terms? Well, the idea is, in a dynamic language, the type of an object is defined by uh, how it can reply to operation, uh, to, to, to requests. So if I have a variable, say, x in this function, and I call the draw method on it, then, and I, I'm successful, that, that means that the object has a type that includes draw. Now, if I'm in a dynamic language and I always take the else branch, then that's all my type will be. It will be only, you know, the type x is only the object that, uh, that can, can be drawn. So it can either a point or a cowboy, you know, either or works. Now, if I'm in a static language, I would have to say that, well, you know, to satisfy the compiler, X has to also have a ready method, even if at runtime I never use that. Yeah? So there, the basic difference is in dynamic typing, you're, um, you, you do check your program, you do check the correctness of these operations, but you check only the one you exercise. And in static typing, you will also verify paths that you don't take. So, so the question then is, um, oops, I went too fast. Static typing has many benefits. It catches errors, okay? It helps you compile code efficiently. It's really easier to compile code if you know the type of things. Um, and it provides great documentation that is always in, in sync. It's machine checked, right? It's always correct. So why is it a horrible idea? I mean, obviously it's a horrible idea since all the dynamic languages uh, ignore it, right? Yet, you know, if we, if we listen to what we teach our students, you know, that's, 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 the, that's the true way. So I'll give you a few controversial statements about static typings for, you know, raising the blood level of some of the, in the audience. <laughs> so uh, static typing only catches the dumb errors the errors that are completely uninteresting, okay? The errors that any test would have caught as well. It can, static ca typing can't usually even catch a null pointer error. There are exceptions, but you know, say, say in Java, it, it doesn't. It cannot catch off by one errors, like you know, this cancer study we had just earlier. Static typing doesn't do anything for me there. Static typing ossifies your code and hinders evolution. So here what I'm, saying is, uh, what I'm saying is, imagine that you want to, to make a local change to test out a new feature in your system. And it happens that the local change touches an interface. So now, in order to make the compiler happy, you have to change the whole system. So a local change ends up having to be propagated globally, and by the time you've made the compiler happy, you know, a couple of hours have passed, and you've wasted good time for no good reason, okay? So they're no good. And the last one I, I'll say is it slows down the rates of development because you know, the, the, the type checker is fundamentally a pessimist beast. It just says, well, there is this one path where it could go wrong, so I'm going to say no. 
just, you know, just to be safe. And you know, when we, we really want to be sure when we're about to ship software, that's probably a safe, a safe approach. But how many times do we ship software versus how many times do we you know, do small edits? It's your pick, right? Depending you know, which way you work, one will be better or, than the other. But I mean, all of these are completely unfounded statements. I agree. I know that. I wrote them, right? I have no <laughs> basis for this. But the people who will contradict me have no basis either. That's the beauty, right? They've never studied this. They don't have any evidence of, to the contrary. So here's a bit of evidence. So there was a study from the University of Duisburg-Essen that, that, that set out to do the following thing. They, they picked um, three tasks which involved injecting semantic bugs in an application. Okay? So semantic bugs being not the kind of things you would catch with a type system. And they said, well, since typed programs are better documented, easier to understand, better structured, it should be easier to find semantic bugs in a typed programming language. So then they gave this to, to, to students, and the students had, uh, were time to, in, in, in respect of how long it took them to fix the bugs, and they picked two. So, so this is the, uh, the axis here is number of seconds to fix a bug. And you know, there are three tasks, two languages. The languages are Gru, EV, and Java. And what is the outcome? Well, you know, statistically, it's a wash. So what can we say? Well, for fixing semantic bugs in this study, a typed language is no better or worse than a non-typed language, all right? So now, if you want to argue about the goodness of types, well, come up with studies that show that they actually improve time to solution. You know, I don't care how many bugs you can find. It's time to solution that matters, okay? So I'll switch. JavaScript, I have to mention it because, well, you, you really, you really can't, um, can't avoid it. I mean, all of you who are browsing the web right now, you know, 10, 000, 10, 000, out of the 10,000 top pages, 91% use JavaScript, right? So, um, you know, if you're browsing the web, you are running a JavaScript program, and that is a dynamic language. And it has all the features of dynamic languages, except it's not extendable. For security reason, you can't add and download native code to your machine, and that's probably a good thing, and it's typically not used interactively. So we'll come back to JavaScript later, but I wanted to mention it because it's a good example of a, a, a very dynamic language. Um, so, so both R and JavaScript have another key feature that is, makes them interesting, and that is reflection. So what is reflection? Reflection is the ability to programmatically manipulate the program structure. So I'll give you a, a, a little bit of an example. Here, here we'll do a little bit of, of R coding. So remember this function with formaldehyde, comma, CO? Well, the implementation, this, this, this could be in, in so there is a, function, uh, a, a feature like this in JavaScript that is built in the language. So you, you, you know, they've put this in the compiler. In, in R, no, this is just a generic function that can be implemented with the normal features of the language, and I'll show you the implementation. So with is a default, is a generic function that takes two arguments, a data object and an expression. And the, the, the goal of with is to evaluate the expression in the context of the data object and its enclosing environment. So how do we do this? Well, it's really grungy. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to use the fact that R is lazy. So what you get here is the original expression unevaluated. And then we're going to use this wonderful function called substitute, which for any unevaluated expression gives you back the original source text. So you get back the original text of that expression. And then we're going to call eval, which is uh, the magic function that takes a string of text and evaluates it in an environment. And we're going just to slice in the data object before the parent frame. So now what we're going to do is, you know, we get an expression, turn into text, change the, uh, the, the environment so that when the interpreter looks up variables of that expression, it finds them in data if they're there. Woof. So this is wonderfully powerful, and I really, really hate it. 
<laughs> but uh, you, know, you can extend the language in two lines. Yeah? That's really powerful. So what does JavaScript give you? It actually gives you less. So JavaScript had this, 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 this strange relationship with reflection because it's less powerful than R. But on the other hand, uh, but, but in R, reflection is really used in only a few places. And in JavaScript, reflection is less powerful, but it's used everywhere. So what is reflection in JavaScript? Well, you can reflectively access properties of an object, its field or its method. So this expression here says, you know, there's an object X, find the field F if it exists, okay? And you give it a string, and that string can come from the user input, can be computed, can be anything. And same for assignment. And you can delete any field. So at any point of time you say, meh, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm tired of having F in this object, let's just get rid of it. You can discover the properties that are in an object by walking through it. So this for thing here takes X and, and you know, walks through every single property in the object. So encapsulation, data hiding, gone. Um, you can do that to global variables. So the global object is called window. And you, know, you can hack, hack it to your heart's content. And lastly, you have eval. So the thing that you don't have in JavaScript is this ability to take uh, expressions, unevaluated expression, turn them back into text. And you don't have the ability to play with uh, namespaces. And this is actually important because in JavaScript, it is, it is possible to do information hiding through uh, local variables of a closure. If you want to know more, ask later. So, so that's, that's what reflection gives you. Very powerful, but it, this makes it completely impossible for static analysis tools to work, right? Because for the static analysis tools, you need to know what these strings are. If you can't figure out, and that's not, not computable, these can be you know, string concatenated at runtime. All right. So another wi widely used and interesting language is Lua. So Lua is a very small, tiny language. And there's a very nice paper here that appeared in ACMQ or recently that describes the history of Lua. And uh, it's a completely uh, a, a scripting, uh, dynamic language, I mean, uh, with, uh, with one twist, which is that it was designed to be embedded in C code. So Lua is just a library that you can link into any C program and then interact with by uh, a, a very nice, powerful, reflective API. So who uses Lua? Lua? Well, Adobe Lightroom uses Lua. So if you're doing Photoshop, you're using Lua. Why? Well, it's the glue between different components. It's used for business logic, controllers. And you know, the, the main reason why they use it is because it gives them very fast turnaround, development time again. How much do they use it? 63% of Adobe Photoshop is Lua. And the rest is a mixture of C++, C, and, and Objective-C. And if you add to this fact that uh, dynamic languages tend to be much more compact, then the amount of behavior you can fit in this 63% is completely staggering. So real systems that people sell for real money use scripting languages. And Lua is widely used also in the gaming industry uh, to, to control to control game. And this comes from a talk on Lua by one of the, uh, on a Lightroom by one of the developers. So I said embeddable. So in order to be embeddable, uh, dynamic language has to have an API that lets it interact with its host environment. So another example of an embedded language is JavaScript. JavaScript was designed to be embedded into HTML. And what that means is, uh, there had to be a way for JavaScript to talk to HTML, and this is the document object model. And then people re quickly realized that they end up with web pages with bits of JavaScript <coughs> coming from different sources, and that's a security nightmare. So they, they, add to, they had to add a security model on top of JavaScript that JavaScript knows nothing about, which is, the, which is sort of an isolation model that you know, is mostly broken, but does a little bit uh, to help. So when you're designing an, a language to be embeddable, you have to think about how 
the, um, the, the, it will interact with the host. And you know, that affects colors the design of the language. And I like to show code, and I can't resist, so I'll apologize for this. <laughs> so this is code. Um, what is it? Well, it's actually the a piece of code called the MySpace virus. So it's an embedded JavaScript program that brought down this MySpace website that used to be f popular with younger folks, right? Uh, all right, we won't read all of it. Let me boil it down to a two-liner. This is the two-liner version of, of the, the virus. So um, let's say that Let's say for simplicity, most of the virus is the attack that actually stole user data, but let's say for simplicity that this is, what, this is the little bit of JavaScript that the uh, attacker wanted to run. You know, alert, boom. If you can run this, you've attacked MySpace successfully. So how did they do this? So in order to run this, you have to run, to tell the, 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 the browser to run some JavaScript. So they wrote this. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of HTML that has embedded a command to JavaScript that says, you know, please run this expression, okay? So MySpace realized that maybe having random code running in the web page wasn't such a good idea. So they came up with this, 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 this great thing. They filtered. So they, f they figured out that the only way to run JavaScript was to have this tag, JavaScript. So the only thing you needed to do was to filter the HTML, see if there was the keyword JavaScript, and reject anything that had JavaScript in it. That works wonderfully. Except the virus, the virus writer wrote this, which is the, the, the word Java with a line break followed by script which is actually not what the filter was looking for. So the filter is happy. And the browser, well, some browsers were kind of helpful because they realized that it's not a valid string to have a line break in the middle. So very helpfully, for, you know, to, to be nice to the user to keep things running, they would glue this back on, and what you would get is this. Okay? So, Yay, we're, go we're good. Well, not quite. There's a tiny problem. If you count the number of quotes, there are a little bit too many quotes in this line. So we have double quotes, and then single quotes, and then single quote again. So that wouldn't parse. Right? That's, that sounds silly, but you actually need those quotes for the attack. You can't deliver the attack without all of these quotes. So then, you know, the game continues. So you realize that, well, you know, I'm an embedded thing, so I can hide things in the rest of the document and use the DOM for communication. So I'll move the attack outside of the, of the string, and now I, I get back one level of quotes, and that's all I need. I can do the attack this way. Good. And, but I still need to ex actually execute the attack. So how do I do that? Well, eval, wonderful. I'll call eval, which will talk to the DOM, grab the string, and evaluate it. So this is the JavaScript, uh, the MySpace virus, in, you know, in a nutshell. And it uses all those nice features of dynamic languages, embedding, reflection, you know, all of that. Very cool. All right. So uh, you know, this is a bit of a downer. Uh, uh, here, a, a more positive note. Embedding works in the scientific context. So this is a, a system called Mercury from um, uh, the National Lawrence Livermore Labs. And what they're doing is they have a big C++ parallel Monte Carlo simulation code. And they want to embed Python in it to, to perform tests and validation of the output, of, yeah, of every iteration of the algorithm. So the reason why they picked, uh, picked Python is that write, writing, um, writing the tests and changing the test code is really fast and doesn't require co whole program recompilation. And it turns out that the system is so big that recompiling, uh, recompiling all that pile of C++ code is so painful that people just didn't want to do it. Well, so uh, they use embedding, uh, embedding to, to solve that problem. Another Lawrence Livermore application uses extendability. So here, what they're doing is they have lots of C++ components that do iner inertial confinement fusion, whatever that is. But it's a lot of C++ code. And in order to coordinate it, to get it to, to, to run in parallel and communicate, they write layers of Python. and 
uh, the Python code gives them a very easy way to steer the, 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 the C++ computation. And they have a shell, so they can start things interactively. And that's, they find this wonderful. The only downside is C++ is a very static language. So how do we get it to be steerable? Well, we need to have a, a, an interface to Python. And they use a technology that generates a wrapper for every C++ component. And at the end of the day, they end up with 1.7 million lines of wrapper code. So this is the price of a, of a horrible static language. OK? Be why is it the price of static? Because if, if, the, if C++ had reflection, I would need no wrappers. You know, I would just call it reflectively. Go for it. All right, I feel it's appropriate to say this now. So wouldn't uh, typing have prevented the previous bug you just described, the MySpace bug? Um, Well, it was, it was a parsing problem. So the, the thing happened in the parser. Right. So even before the type, checker see, the type checker sees expressions in the language and the parser, so they had two, essentially they had two parsers that didn't agree on the grammar of the language. Right, but if the, um, if the thing that follows JavaScript code were of type expression, yes. and you could do your filtering on types rather than having to filter on text, you know, like well, you would have to remove eval. Because I can hide, you know, I can turn, I can do an eval that returns any type you want, but does a lot of side effects before. So, you have to okay. yeah. And that's what some people do to get security in, in, in JavaScript. So, I said failure oblivion, obliviousness. So, dynamic languages try to keep the program running as long as possible. So, there, there are different ways that they do that. So for instance, one thing that is really useful is they let you run and test programs that are not finished. So you have half of your code with glaring ugly holes all over the place. And you can still test the parts that you, you have, you've been working with. In a, in a compiled language, I would have to create lots of stubs for all the missing interfaces, and it just turns into pain. Very easy in a static, uh, dynamic uh, language. Um, they will try to make things work even when they look like they don't, or they can't. So if they see that you have a string and an integer, they will helpfully convert the, the integer into a string or vice versa if it's possible. So they'll do a lot of conversion of data types behind the scenes. And in general, they will decrease the number of errors that you are to handle. So I'll give you an example. So it's a form of best effort execution. So I'll give you an example in JavaScript. So here's JavaScript, and this is creating a new object that has no fields, OK? And this line assigns the value 42 to the field B of object X. I said, just said that X has no fields. So what should the, the language do? Well, obviously, you meant to add this field. So we'll add it for you, and we'll set it to 42. That's, that's, there's nothing bad about this. What about this one? I try to select the field F reflectively, but that doesn't matter, out of X. X doesn't have a field F. So should I die? No, 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 no. I'll return undefined. Undefined is a fine value. I can return it, store it in Y. And now, let's finally, when we get to an error, if I tr actually try to use undefined in any, any, any meaningful way, then and only then do I get an error. So the language has made it really hard for you to see an error. It's interesting because it changes our way to test these languages. You know, in Java, you know, we don't have specification. In Sim Sharp, typically, you don't have a spec. But you use exceptions as the, this handy oracle, right? If I see an exception, that means something has gone wrong. But in JavaScript, you never get that. You can have, you know, this. You know, you can have something like this in the middle of the most tested code. As long as you don't write this line, the program will be fine and will be correct, even though it's doing something obviously wrong. It's interesting, right? So, 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 so. Another case study, which I like a lot, this is CERN, the Nuclear Research Center uh, in Geneva. So CERN uses dynamic languages you know, for everything, Python, Perl, Bash, TCL. But, 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 their analysis code is written in C++. So big monster C++ system. 
because you know, they feel efficiency is really important. But it turns out that their scientists just can't bear using it. Why? Well, every time they want to do a, the smallest thing, they have to recompile. And even if they recompile partially, it takes long enough that you know, it drove them literally nuts. Huh? So the question was, can we turn C++ into a dynamic language? It's a perfectly rational question if you're a physicist, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what is C++? Well, it has one of the attributes, so it's an open source language. So that's already doing good. So what did they do? Well, they really did you know, some of it. It made it extendable and interactive and reflective. So I'll tell you a little bit about this. So for the last 20 years, the CERN has been working on a C++ interpreter called Cint, which interprets most of C++. It's about 400,000 lines of code. It has reflection. It has serialization. It has a lot of stuff in it. 400,000 lines of code. You have to be able to do something with that. And it's the core of their data analysis framework. So they have 20,000 physicists all over the world that are using this. And they swear that without this, they would go nuts. Because it lets them experiment with you know, their equations interactively and get answers right away. And they find this completely invaluable. OK? All right? So they, 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 there are things they don't like. They don't like the syntax. They don't like the speed. And they don't like the fact that it's single-threaded. Uh, what they would like to write is, for each electron in this tree of electrons. Instead, what they write is, gobbledygook. <laughs> All right? Well, there's a paper that talks about the, the, the whole framework. So this is really, really cool, right? Even people who are forced to use static languages want to reinvent that wheel, right? They want them to be dynamic. So here's another case study, and I'm not saying which language it is. It's a system called Pluto. What does Pluto do? It's a simple little program that manages the um, retirement savings of an entire country. So it manages the savings of 5.5 million people in a, you know, some, some northern European country uh, for a value of 23 billion euros. And then euros are actually worth money these days. So what is Pluto? Well, Pluto is this and that. OK? So that's kind of sensitive, right? There are people who have their entire savings invested in this, peel, in this huge pile of pearls, quill, shell, and hutmul, OK? Um, yet, you know, this is completely an anathema to all of us, thinking you can do this. Yet they've been doing this for you know, eight, nine years, and the system works. And worse. Uh, they claim that they've made internal productivity study. Remember, this is this time to solution thing I was mentioning in the beginning. And Perl always win over Java. Actually, I didn't mention the, the funnest part is that the critical parts of the code are in Perl, and there's, there's some Java code for the UI. Yeah. So, and how do they get to the uh, to the uh, to get the, the level of, of assurance? to actually be, you know, to actually trust the system. Well, they have a couple of things, and I'll just mention two. Uh, one is they've disallowed many of the fancier feature of Perl, so no objects, no threading, no floating points, you know, very tiny, tiny language. And the second one, which we'll talk on, uh, about more later, is they invented their own contract notation. So they invented pre and post conditions that are written in Perl and that are added to the code and uh, uh, evaluated at runtime. Yeah? And they test and they do all of these good things, but they manage to get it in a, in a dynamic language. So I've been uh, avoiding this for a while, and it's about the right time. Um, how do these languages perform? Remember, we started with this question, you know, you know, and I was saying, well, maybe performance is the right metric for uh, choosing a language. So one of my colleagues did this study uh, a couple of years ago. So, the, so the, the numbers may be a little bit out of date, but this is roughly why it, how, how it looks like. So above is a geometric mean 
of the performance of Ruby, Python, Perl, PHP, Java, Scala, JRuby, Jiten, Groovy. So, so in the middle is Java, and we normalize to Java performance for no particularly good reason. And then uh, on this side are C interpreters, so interpreters for dynamic languages written in C. And on this side are uh, interpreters or compilers for dynamic languages written on top of the Java virtual machine. So, so what's the takeaway? Well, the geometric mean tells us roughly C interpreters are two to, ti to five times slower than Java. And Java is probably two to five times slower than C, or maybe not, I don't know, it depends these days. But uh, they can be all the way to 145 times slower in some of the worst cases, right? So, so they can be, uh, so for instance, this is Mandelbrot and Ruby runs 105 times slower than Java. And JRuby runs a thousand times slower than Java. And Java-based interpreters are really slow, between 16 and 43 times slower than Java, and up to 1,200 times. So essentially, the, the message uh, here is, yes, you are going to pay a runtime overhead uh, of you for using these languages. And you know, it's, you know, it's up to you to decide whether this is acceptable or not. The numbers are not all bad. So another thing that we looked at was startup times. And here, when you normalize to Java, dynamic languages look re real, real good, right? PHP is uh, 10 times faster than Java at startup. Uh, Ruby also, okay? So, so the bottom line, performance. Well, performance only matters if you're not if you if you don't have a short running computation, or if you don't don't if you aren't I/O bound, if you are I/O bound, if you have a short running computation, it doesn't matter. It's much more important how long it takes you to develop the system. And uh, when performance matters, the question is, what do we do? What shall we do? Well, one option is to rewrite the application in C. But that sucks, right? Because you have a whole brand new batch of bugs that you will have to fix. You could rewrite components. And that sometimes works, but you have the cost of going in and out, uh, crossing these language barriers. You have different semantics. You know, it's, it, it gets messy very quickly. So you know, there's, no, there's no good solution so far. So I'll conclude this talk with, uh, with truth. You know, truth is always good. Right? So, so what do we believe, you know, correctness is the only thing that matters. You know, everything else should be sacrificed on the altar of correctness. Static types are better, period. Um, speed requires compilation. And programs are textual documents that you can hold in your hands. And it turns out that scripting, uh, scripting dynamic languages turn and take the opposite view to all of this. You know, so correctness, well, we are failure oblivious, so we're going to hide errors from you. Uh, static types, what's that? Uh, compilation, hard. Uh, and programs are documents, well, I'm rewriting my code reflectively as I run, so the program is the computation, that's the only thing I have, okay? So, yeah, then maybe there are truths, or maybe there are things we feel, you know, in our guts should be truth, who knows. So I'll conclude this, this by just telling you a couple of uh, observations. So um, I said, you know, dynamic languages make scientists faster. They increase the velocity of science. And I really believe this. And you, know, the, you ask the people at CERN, you ask the people at Lawrence Livermore, they're a key component in their you know, day to day work. You ask statisticians. So, so we can't completely ignore those, they're, they're here to stay. Uh, I think that dynamic languages are interesting because they're like a gateway drug to computing. You know, they're the easy way to get in and get people hooked. So all we need to do is then to have, you know, this um, to have a pathway from these 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 ones to harder drugs. You know, so it's a way to get all the way to functional programming in Haskell or, or F sharp or something, you know, real serious like you know something that we like. Um, 
And lastly, I'd say, you know, dynamic languages sometimes really could use the static features of static languages, sometimes. And the question which I'll try to address in the second part is, what can we do about this? And you know, this is the end of the, uh, the sort of the first, a little bit longer part of this talk. I'll pause here for questions or people to, so people can you know, leave and go to other sessions and so on. Thank you. Um, obviously, in this whole world, there is also there are tools like MATLAB, which are interestingly not present on that Powell's books and the Langtop site. Mm -hmm. um, but with relation to that, and in particular talking about performance, can you add some comments about the sort of improvements in just-in-time compilation, the sort of JIT technology? And I note with interest looking at C and Fortran versus, say, something like MATLAB, where even in the last five years, um, there have been some really huge strides. And if you couple that, say, to partial evaluation or other things, you have that all of those features that you talked about with dynamic languages, but there is other technology coming in behind the scenes. And I, I just wonder whether you wanted to comment on that with respect to performance, so just-in-time compilation, so things like that. It works, and I'll be talking a little bit more about it in the, the second part. So, so the, an, the answer is yes, definitely. That's one way to get there. Yeah. Yes? Uh, so one question I've always had about dynamic languages is how much, uh, do you have any data on how much the thing people object to is the, uh, the annotation overhead versus how much they object to the static nature of the languages? In other words, do people really you know, use a field at one point during the computation to hold an integer, and then it later in the computation store a different type of value in that field? Um, so, so I think the question is really, you know, do people, will, if I give a dynamic language to a bunch of programmers, will they naturally start programming in a sort of static style or not? Or will they actually use? Um, you know, dynamism. Um, so the data I'll present in the second part suggests the, uh, that they are actually using the dynamism. Now, the question is, are they using it for good reasons? That's an interesting question, and the, the answer is, you know, yes, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so you talked about the bug finding abilities of uh, static typing mm -hmm. versus dynamic typing, right? Yeah. So uh, very simple but uh, very common scenario, right? Misspell. Mm -hmm. If you misspell... Dynamic name, languages don't help. If you misspell, right. you get some random code. And what do, do, do the people do in Perl? They write test cases. Is that perfect? No, because it's only as good as the paths you explore. Right, but isn't the cost of static typing you know, much lesser than repeatedly testing? And you tell me. Conduct a study. Find, let's find out. So the, my point is there are these two, two, two claims, right? People in the dynamic camp will tell you that you know, they don't make type errors in practice. The, the errors that the type system catches are either so, things they catch very quickly or that just don't happen to them. Is, are, they, are, they, are they lying? I can't tell. I, I don't have data. People in the static camp say, oh, but it's always better to, to check ahead of time. Yeah, maybe, but it costs you in development time. So, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting question. We don't have data. I'm always sort of trying to, you know, provoke a little bit by being, you know, slightly over the top here, but it's a, it's a real question. And as scientists, you know, who are selling programming language technologies, you know, it's, it's really a shame that we have mostly ignored this. Right, because the first example that you gave, right, the scientific, uh, yeah. so, I mean, such bug could be there even if you just misspell a field and, you yeah. know. Yeah, 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 I agree. Results, right. I, you know, I'm, I'm completely, so I'm in the middle. I see both sides. Yeah. Well, Sorry, say that again? Right. Right. So you can have tools, right, that will help catch some things. But, you know, it's only limited. So if your language has reflection, for instance, yeah, the tools will not help, things like that. Yeah. 
So um, another language that has it is Perl, which you specified before it didn't. So the Perl community actually picks on the rest of the other dynamic uh, language communities because they lack the use strict feature of mm -hmm. Perl, which is really spell checking on symbols. Yeah, so that's... everything has to be lexically uh, scoped, right. defined, and then you can use it. Whereas in something like Python or Ruby, you can easily reuse something that you didn't expect to use sure. before that's been defined in their scope. I, I guess the, the point here is there are different ways to get some of the benefits of type checking. You know, so you can make sure that you're not inventing new symbols. That's you know, what this does. But it only means that, well, you're not inventing new symbols. You may misapply an existing symbol to the wrong thing, and then it doesn't help. Right, yes. One thing that you didn't uh, address is sort of the social nature of programming, mm -hmm. so that all of these uh, programs can run on different architectures, different systems, and that, that really uh, lends itself to uh, people working together more often, uh, perhaps. Uh, right, so, so that part I, I don't have much to say, sort of the social nature of, of, uh, of programming. It is true that there are many you know, many sort of user communities very vibrant around dynamic languages, but I don't know if it's just because it, they feel, you know, they have something, you know, that bond, bonds them or if this is linked to technical issues, but I can't say. For many say. people, when you started out with the question of what language would you suggest they use, mm -hmm. It, it may be more important, the, the social nature. Right, which come, true, true, true. I mean, this was purely on technical ground. So, so Gary has uh, been asking. Well, so what about scheme? How do you classify that? Is that a? Definitely a dynamic language. But it can be compiled, right? Yeah, what I said was compilation <laughs> is a sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a red herring. Now you can compile anything. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just a question nowadays, it's just whether it's efficient or not, right? But it's, people think of those languages are interpreted because you have this REPL, this evaluate, interactive mode. You know, maybe one last and, yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm an electrical engineer, so you'll forgive me for the question, not a computer scientist. Um, would you, what would you recommend for young kids, you know, 13, 13 year old type things, for, um, to start off with um, that would give them some life into computer science and software engineering? That's a, that's a, that's a really hard question, right? Uh, I'm on the spot. I have to actually make a decision here. Uh, <laughs> hmm. I, it, I, th I think the language is less important than you know the environment that uh, and the things they can do with this language, right? So 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 you know, uh, if you have a nice interactive development environment that lets you lets you build things quickly, then it's a very good you know it's a very useful language. I think a lot of the software engineering concerns we have can be delayed for a while. Uh, you know, often it's hard just to get kids interested in something, right? So, so if we have to learn about type system, monads, and all what not, then you know, maybe they will pick some other discipline. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so unfortunately, you still have me for, for a bit, so I'll continue. Um, the afternoon sessions will be, held, uh, will be by Summit, so there'll be some variety then. So uh, I'll, I'll continue with this, uh, the second part of this lecture, um, and I'll try to go faster because the questions were, uh, took a little bit more time than I had anticipated. So what I wanted to tell you about a little bit here was, what are the research challenges? Where uh, do I think interesting work is happening uh, in dynamic languages? And I'll tell you a little bit about things that, that I've worked on and, and other things that have been done uh, by other people, including uh, people in this room. So there are four important questions, I think, for uh, dynamic languages that we really need to get a better handle on. The first one is, we have to understand what people do with dynamic languages, right? So if we don't know how they use the feature, so the question is, one of the questions was, you know, do people actually naturally program in a sort of static discipline? We don't know. We have to understand what people do with this if we want to provide better languages, provide higher, higher, better uh, implementations of those languages. So that's one. 
The second topic will be uh, just-in-time compilation, new advances in just-in-time compilation. I'll mention uh, works that was done here, which uh, on the, this notion of tracing, just in, uh, tracing uh, compilers. Then the next two topics are sort of trying to see if we can take dynamic languages and add some static behavior, uh, some static features to them. So the first part will be trying, sorry, trying to look can we take a dynamic language and gradually, incrementally, add types? Because we think types are better, right? And the second one will be, can we do what the Perl guys did with their contracts in Pluto? That is, add pre and post conditions. And you know, what does this look like? And you know, what does this entail? So, um, so I'll start with the first one. So the question is, OK, I've told you dynamic languages, blah, blah, blah. How dynamic are they really? And we did this, we didn't know, because what we were wondering, the reason we were wondering is we were designing a new language called Thorn, and we were thinking, you know, we would like to make it dynamic, but not too dynamic, because we would like to, to, to compile it efficiently. So what is the right point in the design? What features do you actually need, and which ones can we leave, leave, uh, leave off? And to understand that, we wanted to look at real code. So we, uh, we'll, we picked JavaScript. And there's, the results are summarized in a PLDI paper last year. And uh, we picked JavaScript. And um, we analyzed uh, the behavior of JavaScript programs. So there's a couple of slides on JavaScript, but I'll just zip through them, just explaining what JavaScript is. So I'll, I'll spend a second on methodology. So what do, how do we do this? So what we did is we took Safari, the J Apple, uh, Apple browser, and we instrumented it to record every operation that is performed at runtime when you, you browse the web. So that gives us very long traces of execution of a program. And then those traces, we, we, ran, we, we went to the 100 top websites, and uh, we gathered you know, traces for those. Uh, and then we gathered actually multiple traces. This, this gives us about eight gigabytes of trace data, which we then you know, sort of shrunk down to, to a database of 100, 500 megabytes of behavioral data about JavaScript programs. So what we got was, what do JavaScript programs do when you download it from the web? So you go to, to Bing, what kind of JavaScript code gets run? What does it do? How dynamic is it? So you know, in, the, in the slides, I, I'll pick on a few few websites that are you know, widely known, like Gmail, Google, uh, Bing, and Facebook, and so on. So, and we started our study by um, looking at some common assumptions. And you know, so you read papers, and people say, well, we expect certain things about the behavior of JavaScript code. So I'll, I won't list all of the ones we looked at, but just a couple to give you an idea. So the first one you often hear is, oh, JavaScript programs, well, they're really small. So why do people like to say that? Well, because they have static analysis, analysis tools that are not scalable. So it's actually better if you have a small program, no. for instance. Um, or that call site dynamism is low. So what does that mean? Well, if I see a call, x.f, Every time I, call, I get to this point in the program, I may end up executing a different piece of code. So if I, if I always execute the same piece of code, we say dynamism is low. If I execute many pieces of code from the same point, dynamism is high. If dynamism is, dynamism is low, it's easier to analyze the program. It's easier to generate uh, efficient code. Uh, another one that people would like to be true is that the function signatures that are defined in the source text are actually meaningful, that we can use them to define, describe, ascribe types to the program. Uh, that objects are first created, they're populated, and then they're just used in like normal objects, you know, by reading and writing fields. And lastly, that eval doesn't happen, and it's harmless, okay? Well, it's, a, it's a reasonable set of assumptions, and we can find papers that made every single one of these. So when we go and we look at the data, say, for instance, program size is modest. Well, eh, not so much, right? Facebook is a mega, one mega five of JavaScript code. 
So that's not modest by any, any stretch of imagination. And a lot of these uh, go you know, over 200 kilobytes. So this is you know, actually big chunks of codes you're running on those websites. And it's only growing. Um, call side dynamism. So here's a graph, and the way to read this on the y-axis is the number of call sites, and the, on the x-axis is the number of methods the call site invokes. So the way to read this is we have found, one call, uh, we have found 100,000 call sites, 100,000 points in a program where every time you come to this point, you always call the same function. So these are really good, good, good call sites because they're completely monomorphic. You could inline them, you can uh, analyze them, you can understand them if you knew that they are, uh, if you could tell. And what we also found is there is one call site that dispatches to 1,000 functions. So, so one point of the program, and every time you come there, it calls a different function. ka -chung, ka -chung. And then, well, that could be an outlier, but the problem is there's this big clump here where we are between 50 and uh, you know, 200 uh, uh, targets per, per call site, and that's not going to be analyzable, that's not going to be easily uh, optimizable. So another thing that people would like to be true is that properties are added only at object initialization. So what we did is, we looked at every object and we, we sort of uh, tracked its lifetime and tracked the kinds of operations that are performed through its life. And we, we graphed this, and this is beautiful graph per, uh, done in R. It's really cool, I like it. Uh, so what does this graph tell us? Well, the white part is objects that die. So you know, as soon as we go white, you know, all of these objects are dead. So you know, most objects are alive in the beginning and then they die very quickly. There's some, some tail. Uh, the, the next part are reads. So we read, read properties on an object, the field, throughout the object's lifetime. So you can see this goes on all the way till the end of the lifetime we access uh, their properties. The next one we do often is updates, so that is write to fields. And it sort of makes sense that there are more writes in the beginning when you create an object, you're populating its field. A little bit, so this dotted line is at the end of the constructor, and then still a little bit more in the beginning, and then you have writes occasionally throughout the lifetime, but much fewer than read. That's normal, that's what most programs will do. Now, the more interesting one are adds. So this is when you take an object and you add a field that wasn't there, or you add a method that wasn't there. So clearly we're going to add a lot in the beginning, but unfortunately, we keep on adding throughout the object lifetime. So there is no notion of type here. The objects keep getting changed. And deletes, deletes are really weird. So this is the Google website. I have no clue what they're doing because they're creating an object, they give it some fields, and they start deleting those fields right away. Why? God knows. But it's certainly not static, certainly not easily analyzable. The next thing we said, well, f uh, signatures are, are meaningful. Well, uh, what, is a sig what is a type? Well, maybe a type is the set of, feature, uh, of properties an object has. Well, in JavaScript, I can create a constructor person that returns objects of two types. One that uh, some have just two fields, name and sex, and some have three. Uh, there's a likes uh, field, too. So we looked at how many times does this occur. So over 2,000 of constructors always return the same object. But there is one constructor out there that returns 300 different types. So using signatures as an indication of a type is, uh, um, is, is, is hopeless. Eval, in, infrequent and harmless, not at all. So 59% uh, of the top 100 uh, websites use eval. 43% of the top 10,000 use eval. So everybody's using eval. How many, how many call sites to eval? There's one, one website that has 1,300 call sites to eval. So there's one JavaScript program that calls eval thir in, from 1,300 uh, uh, 1, different places. How many times do we call eval? There's, there's a program out there that calls it 100,000 times. How big is the code we pass to eval? Well, mostly it's less than 64 bytes, 
But there are programs that, that send 500 kilobytes of code to eval. So basically, you get the gamut of behaviors, but it is used, it is used pretty much everywhere, and it is used in ways that are completely hopeless, we think. So uh, we, I'll, I'll skip the categorization, but we, we categorized eval in different categories. And we also looked at where do the strings come from. And one of the interesting thing is, so this graph shows you these two first bar are strings passed into eval that are constants or constructed constants. And the white part on the top, which is about 15%, uh, are strings that come from user input. So 15% of websites are just taking user input, whatever it is, and stuffing it in, into eval and you know, hoping that this will work out. So is this all important? Well, it, understanding the behavior of programs drives your implementers, right? So we looked at the behavior of real websites and the behavior of benchmarks. And here's a real website and here's a benchmark. Can you spot the difference? Well, so does this matter? Well, we looked at the performance improvement of Firefox on benchmarks between version 1.5 and, and 3.6. The, the speed up was 13 fold. So Firefox runs 13 times faster on benchmarks. How much faster does it run on a we real website? Well, three times. And essentially since version three, it has, an, it has flatlined. So what are we saying? Well, if you're not looking at real program behavior, you get, you know, you optimize for the benchmarks, you optimize for things that don't matter. So this is a good transition point to talk a little bit about one of the cool new ideas. So this is what, uh, what somebody was alluding to, uh, just-in-time compilation. So there is, uh, so this is work, uh, the slides uh, uh, are, from work that was done here on the Spur system, which is a, a JavaScript compiler. And the basic idea of trace-based compilation is to, to leverage the fact that dynamic languages need a just-in-time compiler, right? We can't compile ahead of time. Okay, we know that. But, you know, if we look at what the program does at runtime, we can notice that it's doing always the same thing, perhaps. And if we notice that, then we can compile one particular path in the code very efficiently. And um, so that's basically what they do. And what, um, um, blah, 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 um, what they do, and I'll give you a, a little bit of an example. So here's how, uh, here's a little bit of JavaScript code. And this JavaScript code loops uh, through the program. And uh, what it does is uh, 1,000 times it's going to add one. And one time out of those 1,000 times, uh, uh, 990 time times it's going to do uh, integer addition. And once it will, do, uh, uh, it will add a string. Well, what this really means is the, co the program will compute up to 988. And then it will try to add uh, a string to an integer that will convert the string, uh, the, the integer to a string, and then it will concatenate a bunch of ones at the end. So well, this is what the program does. So the key for tracing compilation is to say, well, you know, plus really depends on its, on its uh, operands. It does uh, many runtime checks, it's very expensive. So let's optimize the loop for the case where we have a plus that operates on integers, and let's once we, we, we degenerate to a string case, we just run in an optimized code. And basically, this is what, uh, what the uh, Spur system does. So for instance, when they compile this, this loop in unoptimized mode, this, this inner loop takes 35 method calls and runs through 224 instructions. So, from, uh, so, so this is all the code that this will actually touch. But when we run in, with a trace-based JIT, this, this boils down to a smaller, a smaller piece of, of code. This is about 10 instructions and two guards. So we get a seven-fold, fa seven-x fa uh, speed up. I'm rushing a bit, and I apologize for, for rushing through this, but this is really cool stuff. And do it, pushing that in more scripting languages can help you um, can help you get back the performance that you, uh, that you need. 
So here's um, a bit of work that we actually did. And the idea is, uh, you know, we like dynamic types, as I said, because they have these nice properties. We like static types, but uh, typically they don't coexist. So could we have a language where you have both of these? And could you have a language where you can go from dynamic to static in a seamless way? And um, so what I'll, I'll just show you is basically what we were proposing, which is a design called like types. And uh, what we're proposing is, um, is, an, is the idea that we want a language that is as permissive as possible, that never says no on the dynamic side, and that somehow rewards good behavior. So if the programmer add type annotations, we want to show that the program will run faster. And what we came up with is a language called Thorn, which has two worlds. It has the dynamic world, which is like any dynamic language, and it has the static world, where you have you know, the same kind of static annotations you would have in Java or C Sharp. And then we add something in the middle, which we, we call like types, which are types that are sort of half static, half dynamic. So the way they work is when you declare a like type, you get local type checking, but you can still feed in dynamic values into those. And uh, I do have examples, and you get syntax like this. You can say that a value is a like, a point. And you know, I have more detail, but I'll skip. And I'll only go to the reward. So our, our language, when we implemented it, we measured it, so there, uh, we measured it comparing to Python and, and Ruby. And for one benchmark, the untyped version was running just you know, in the middle of Python and Ruby. But by adding about 10 type annotations, poof, we run uh, five times faster. So very clear reward. And you know, it, it took no effort. I mean, it's not like we had a, 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 a real good JIT. We were just running on, on, on a Java virtual machine. So there's a lot of uh, work in that field. And I recommend, if you're interested, to look at these. And I'll finish with um, a mention of code contracts, which is another project that is being done here uh, at MSR. And I think it's really exciting. And you know, for dynamic languages, this is really what you want. This is the idea that we would like to add pre and post conditions that catch interesting errors, as opposed to the stupid errors type systems give you. And uh, we want to do this in a, as non-intrusive way as possible. So imagine you have a pop method. What, you, what the code contracts let you do is insert code in your programming language, in your notation, that will specify both the pre and post condition of that piece of code. And that this is really powerful, because it lets people specify behavior very cheaply. You know, they, they don't need to learn any new, well, very little, right? They don't need to learn a new notation, a new language. It's in the, the, their language. And this can be either used then by static checking tools, like the Clouseau checker, or residualized into runtime check, or just plain, plain ignored and used as simple documentation. But it leverages the existing language infrastructure, and that's really a, a, a cool result. So to conclude, um, so I think in terms of research direction, we need to understand better what dynamic programs do to offer better features for dynamic programmers and uh, also for, for improve, for, to improve our, uh, the performance of our implementations. We can use just-in-time compilation techniques to speed up uh, uh, dynamic languages if we use this adaptive nature uh, and leverage the fact that we can observe what the program is doing and learn from it. And finally, um, we can use both contracts and, and gradual types to add some of the static, ty uh, static guarantees back into these languages. And I'll conclude with that. Yep. Most of it, very few, 
We found very few. Uh, so the question is, how much is generated JavaScript? And most, as far as we can tell, some of it is obfuscated. But as far as we can tell, most of it is humanly written. Out of the 10,000 top pages, you know, I would say 90 plus are 98, 99 percent. 